webinar. Recording has started. We are live and we are recording. Great. Good, good morning. Um, I am Jonathan Salvan. I'm the chair of the OPM subcommittee for the Amherst uh, School Building Committee. Um, I will uh, let the, the folks uh, on the committee uh, uh, introduce themselves quickly and then let you all introduce yourselves and, and uh, get started on your presentation. And since I went top down as people appeared last time, I'm gonna go from the bottom up. Um, and so I'll let uh, Dwayne introduce himself. Hello, good morning. My name is Dwayne Chamble and I am the out of school time coordinator for the district of Amherst. And next, at least on my screen is Steve. I'm Steve Schreiber. I am a town counselor. I'm the vice chair of the elementary school building committee. And my day job is I'm the chair of architecture at UMass. Then Kathy. I'm Kathy Shane, and I'm chair of the full building committee. I'm also on the town council. Steve is on the town council as well. And Anthony. Uh, Anthony Delaney, procurement officer and member of the committee. My so name the is Joe I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. My name is Trip Elmore, I'm project director uh, proposed for this project from Doran Whittier. Christina Delangelo, project manager with Doran Whittier. Michael Cox, project manager with Doran Whittier. Rachel Donner, assistant project manager with Doran Whittier. Hey, good morning, folks. Terry Hartford. I, uh, I'll be the on site project manager during construction. Okay. Mike, can you load our presentation? We should be good. Everybody see that? Yep. Terrific. Okay. Well, I'm going to get started here. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to introduce Doran Whittier first, and then we're going to introduce our team members with a little more detail. Um, I started Doran Whittier Management Partners 11 years ago and basically came from a perspective that the owners and I had learned this when I was at Turner running a, a large job in Newton, that an owner-led company uh, really brings another level of responsibility to the projects and creates a little different feeling for the projects. So I started this business going after public school work. 90% of our business is based in um, mass school buildings and the majority of it with uh, MSBA funded projects. And uh, I wanted to start a business where, again, the owners were leading the charge and were actively uh, managing the day-to-day -day work with the project because I found that it gave better results and more accountability um, from an OPM standpoint uh, to the owner so that we would build better relationships with our owners. And we found that um, that has been true uh, as we've gone through the last 11 years. Um, I also thought that we could provide a better service because I, I'm coming very much from a construction background I'll go into in my introduction of my experience, but I'm joining a firm that had an architectural arm to it. And your projects are um, balanced with a construction firm and an architectural firm to deliver uh, the necessary services in order to make these projects go forward. Well, if your OPM comes from a background where they know how to do both elements of that um, execution plan, we can manage better. And so that was kind of my fundamental um, thoughts when I was putting this business together. And, and for you and for this community, I think that the, the team that we have presenting to you today brings all of the necessary skill sets and experience to really develop a uh, tremendous project in the design phase and execute it very well in the construction phase. So with that, we're gonna introduce ourselves. Um, Mike, if you'll go to the next slide. My, my background is in construction, as I've mentioned. I've spent um, over 25 years in uh, large corporate construction. Uh, I've built projects for Intel in California, the cleanest clean room um, in the world at the time. 
and I built high rises in uh, the the um, in urban settings. I've spent the last ten years building schools. Uh, excuse me, last thirteen years building schools. I, I uh, finished up my career with Turner uh, before starting this business on a uh, large um, school in Newton. Uh, I think the background is relevant to you because I can see things early on that are likely to occur um, as I'm watching projects go forward. And that kind of vision of having six to eight months of knowledge of if we don't do something today, this is the likely outcome, brings real leadership to the projects that I'm on and really has a uh, risk management side to it that uh, you don't necessarily find unless you have that kind of experience. My understanding of cost and schedules um, and risk management brings um, uh, an insight that allows me to be um, a true team leader and hold the others on the team accountable. And I promise to bring that to you um, every day because that's my involvement in the projects I get involved with. That introduce uh, Christina. Hi everyone, I'm Christina Delangelo again, project manager with Doran Whittier. Um, I've been working in the design and construction industry for over 15 years now. And I've been working with Doran Whittier for the past five. I've worked on six school projects with Commonwealth, four of which were MSBA core projects. And part of my expertise and experience is knowing and understanding the MSBA process. Uh, we have a high level of understanding their requirements, and we work with them as they are refined and further developed. Um, I'm a very hands-on person. You'll see me at all of the meetings. I'll be involved from the project from day one to ribbon cutting. I have experience with working uh, with community involvement working groups, the SVC, budget, schedule, and risk management. And my job will be to manage the work and deliverables of our team to ensure that um, all of the expectations of the SVC are being met. I'm currently working on a school project right now with an 18 member SVC group with, that has many um, industry professionals. They are an extremely involved uh, SVC in the project and have been since day one. Uh, many of these members have worked on previous construction projects in their past, and I'm told that we're an extension of their team, and our level of customer service exceeds anything that they've ever experienced before. So uh, I look forward to working with you and your team on this project. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Cox. Thank you, Christina. So I'm Mike Cox. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be your project manager uh, of controls. Um, since Jordan, Jordan Whittier, I've had the opportunity to work on seven projects, four of which are MSBA um, projects in this role that I will serve for you. Uh, and in my role, I'll be maintaining the budget from the conception of our contract all the way through the MSBA audit at the end of the, at the very end. Uh, I'll be using our proprietary budget system that you'll hear us refer to as the dashboard. And the dashboard was built by us to be a, a perfect mirror to the MSBA's ProPay system, which I'm sure you've heard a little bit about now, uh, if not have already dealt with. Uh, but it's a, a more detailed and transparent version of that that will actually give you uh, login access to, so you can review it in real time, anytime you want on your phone. Um, if you're just curious, it's, it's fully transparent and up to date. And then in addition, I'll also be working with you and ultimately handle the responsibility for the monthly MSBA submissions, which obviously is a very key component to getting your reimbursement in a timely fashion. Um, so that'll maximize both your return speed and the accuracy to help us along at the very end in audit. And with that, I will pass it to Rachel. Thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Donner. I am the assistant project manager. Since joining Doran Whittier, I've worked on three MSBA jobs with this team in Lexington, Manchester, and Peabody. My role on the Fort River Elementary School project would be working directly with the project managers and assisting them with communication and proper documentation. I would provide documentation for all of our meetings and conference calls. These meeting minutes are critical and they ensure transparency with team members as well as the community. We have seen previously that these components lead to a successful partnership, and I'm truly looking forward to collaborating and working with this committee. With that, I'll turn it over to Terry. Thanks. 
Technologically challenged. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's Terry again. As I mentioned, I'll be the on-site project manager during construction. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of doing that role uh, on two different projects for Dorham Whittier, um, having come from uh, the energy business where I spent 25 years building power plants pretty much around the world. Um, and my role in, in um, on site is really to manage the process of construction, and that's working with CM, the designer, all the key stakeholders. And ultimately, my goal is to deliver what uh, we've designed for on behalf of the owner. And so it, it really is to minimize disruption uh, for all of you. And I'm just coming off the completion of a job that we're probably going to spend a fair bit of time talking about in Lexington, which I know your design firm actually put in front of you back in 2018, which is the Mariah Hastings School. It's Massachusetts' first net uh, zero energy project. And, and it's a very interesting project. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, I also wanted to mention just on a, on a personal level, you know, I've lived as a parent and a resident um, of a community that's very similar to yours. I live in a little town called West Newbury. We have a regional school here that years ago, the towns uh, decided not to go forward with a new school, which was uh, not suggestively to my liking. Uh, but about five years ago, they got back into the MSBA project. And uh, parents and uh, folks in this town really kind of got themselves together and uh, worked towards getting the word out. And they worked directly with um, the design firm and the architect and the OPM. And while we weren't the OPM on that job, I'm happy to say that Doran Whittier was the architect of the Pentucket Middle High School. And over, you know, we did manage to get the vote for the three towns. That project is being built right now. I was just there last week with Brad Door, who's the principal uh, owner in the architect side. And, it, and it's, it's a wonderful feeling to put all that hard work in and then realize a dream and see you know, the impact the school is gonna have on your community. So I know from kind of a personal parent perspective and uh, professional perspective, Dorm Whittier, this is kind of what we do on, on all sides of our business, which is to you know have communities, you know, develop their their dreams and, and put them into into place. So, very much look forward to working with you on doing that, and I'm sure we'll be taking questions as we go through this. But Trip, I think we're we're back to you. Okay, yeah. So that's basically our 15 minute introduction, um, and we can go into your questions unless you have anything for us before we do that. Nope, we'll, we'll, we'll dive right in. Um, okay. Anthony, you want to start off with the, the first one? I will do that. Uh, could you describe one particularly challenging elementary school project for which you served as OPM and talk about some of the lessons you learned there? Sure. So um, we have that first question. If you can just go back one slide, Mike. So from a perspective of challenging projects, I, th I think every project has its own challenges. And uh, the, one of the jobs that um, I started out with when I started Doran Whittier uh, Management Partners was the Bancroft Elementary School. We um, are currently uh, working on the Memorial Elementary School in Manchester. And as we've mentioned, the Maria Hastings Elementary School in Lexington. Uh, each one of these has uh, plenty of challenges that had to be overcome and managed but I think the best one to start with is Marie Hastings because it's very relevant to several aspects of uh, your project. So when we look at the Marie Hastings Elementary School in Lexington, next slide, Mike, um, I, I just sort of will lay it out. You see a, a um, rendering of the site. You see uh, obviously in red letters, the new building, there's a parking lot and turnaround um, you can make out the silhouette of a black line, which is representative of the existing school. You can see from just the layout on this slide that there are various things to deal with, including wetlands, which has similarities to uh, the Fort River Elementary School. Um, there is uh, a tight knit community uh, surrounding the actual site. The site itself, once you put the building and parking lot and playground in place, doesn't really have much left um, there other than a uh, baseball field. And, um, and so the, the site is, is significantly constricted when you consider that you're trying to build a new building while operating an existing uh, element, elementary school. Um, 
you know, just the simple things of moving uh, the school folks in and out every day while you're moving the building components in and out every day and the workers coming and going every day. And you have to build separation. Obviously, safety is the paramount concern. Uh, there were a lot of elements and a lot of this has to do with the construction phase or the design phase of how do you actually orchestrate, make this a safe um, place for the kids, make it a, a viable building site for the construction, um, keep separation, uh, keep the neighbors um, as minimally disturbed as possible and, uh, and how do you have um, relief valves if all of a sudden something comes up and something will come up where you have to put an all stop and make things, um, uh, make things right before you get going again. So uh, that's just in, in talking about the site and how do you overcome these kinds of challenges? You address them early on and you play a lot of what if scenarios and you say, well, if this is gonna happen, then we are going to have to react in such a way and everybody has to be aware that that's what's going to happen. Another factor, which again is similar to Amherst, is that Lexington had a lot of community involvement and there were special um, interest com committees formed, one of them being Sustainable Lexington, where they really wanted to influence how this building was going to be um, constructed, how it was gonna be managed over the long term, what its energy uses were gonna be and the direction that they came with uh, in the feasibility study stage ended up causing the uh, selectmen in Lexington to adopt the net zero com, um, uh, building and, and to be willing to explore the options to get to a net zero building. And, um, and as this is one of the groundbreaking uh, buildings, there are a lot of factors that were unknowns at that time. Uh, and, and I would say they're still being developed as, as we go into the net zero world. We'll talk about the net zero in the following questions. Um, overall, this project was uh, uh, a, a grand success. And, um, and I think it's largely due to the level of planning and anticipation of the kind of issues that we were going to face. Are there any other questions that uh, I can answer on this? Hey, Trip. I might just add one thing. Um, sure. I think one of the one of the best things about this project for our team is that we've all worked on this job together. Um, uh, that's a great point. So it's it's we have a very cohesive team in terms of how we manage um, our various roles, and so I can give you an example. You know, early on in the project, Christina really leads um, that communication with uh, the community. And eventually that you move into construction and, you know, somebody in my position kind of takes over. And when you look at a project like that, you see all those houses, all those people have names and Christine and I know all of them. And you know, it's, it's getting involved with the community so that you can, as Tripp mentioned, minimize disruption and disturbance. And so, you know, I think we're all super proud of this project because uh, it came out you know, under budget, on schedule, it's, it's, a, it's a real testament to a lot of hard work. Great. Okay, uh, the next question. Yep, glad to. Uh, I, I'm gonna read that one. Um, describe your experience with uh, net zero energy capable schools or other net zero projects. Please also discuss the costs, the cost considerations and how these were managed as part of the process. So, Again, we're going to focus on the Lexington Maria Hastings Elementary School as um, our net, net zero ready building. So initially, when we went into feasibility uh, as a starting place, as every community, I think, does, uh, looks at lead or mass chips. And lead silver is the minimum, and you get 2% points from the MSBA, which I know you're aware of. Well, early in the feasibility, it was initially said, well, what is the possibility of us going to lead gold? So 
we started from that standpoint. And as I mentioned, we were getting involved in the feasibility, the uh, sustainable Lexington group got support locally to um, go to a net zero place for the building which is a significant step. And, you know, I, I don't think it's probably that much different than the bylaws that you passed um, for net zero in Amherst. Um, so, so there's some similarities there. There has to be a, a, a commitment from the community to actually go that, go that route. So when, when that was introduced, uh, we then quickly went away from traditional fossil fuel based systems to an all electric building. And when we started to explore the all electric building, various other components come into play and, and the ideas of um, whether it's biofuel or geothermal, certainly PV systems um, all come quickly to the top. But what also comes into play is that these are all codependent with other systems. If your building, for example, isn't super tight or insulated um, with efficient systems, these other systems don't function in the same capacity that, that you would expect them to. So um, there's, a, there's a whole model of how you do this that is really important um, to follow in order to achieve that net zero energy consumption um, place. And it starts largely in the, um, in the world of energy conservation, first and foremost. And, um, and that directly comes into play with, uh, with the costs. We can go to the next slide. So when we look at costs, we look at the overall net zero um, process, and I'm going to call it a process because it has so many components that are um, linked together in order to make the achieve achievement of net zero possible. And when you look at them independently, um, they don't contribute in the same way. So it's really a synergistic type of model. So if you're looking at the costs on a building, I think you have to look at them collectively as they are inter interdependent on one another. So the, the process that, you've, that we followed, and I think that is pretty standard in the industry, is that you have to start first with energy conservation. And energy conservation for a net zero project starts with trying to make the building needs somewhere in the neighborhood of 40%. It, it varies from you know, which expert you listen to it's saying take the energy consumption down by roughly 40%. And how do you do that? You do it with um, certainly the building envelope and that simple insulation is cheap. And, and you know, we all can, can visualize that. Having daylighting and lighting control so that you're, you're effectively using your lighting systems in the building. It's an interesting quandary here because when you add daylighting in, you're talking about obviously putting windows in. Windows are your major heat loss on a building. So you have this fine balance of how much glass, what type of glass, and, and how do you um, minimize your heat loss um, or heat gain in the summertime if you're using it in the summer uh, effectively. And that's part of this calculation. Energy recovery, is, um, is an absolute must. If you're heating the air coming into the building and exhausting it because you're, you're really focused on indoor air quality, you wanna recover some of that heat loss as it's being exhausted. And then having active radiant um, heat and cooling as part of the design of the building is, um, is critical. After you go through that sort of analysis of the building, you really want to define your baseline parameters by which you can benchmark um, how you are measuring what, um, uh, what the costs of the building are. So obviously cost of energy and the projections in a standard model, um, whether it's electricity or whether it's oil or whether it's gas need to be projected out 20 to 40 years. 
The uh, parameters use of the space, is the building gonna be used from six to six? Is it six to 10? Is it seven days a week? Is it being used in the summer? Uh, come into play as to what your energy use is gonna be. And then really understanding what is your energy load when the building is occupied versus when it's not or when it's partially um, uh, being used comes into that equation of what are the costs and how do you manage them? Because this is a factor of, that's driving cost. Then obviously it's very critical to make the um, uh, make choice to buy very high energy equipment, components, and products. You, you want high efficiency um, products in the building that run uh, your daily activities. And then you start to explore the uh, alter alternative renewable energy sources, whether it's the PV, whether it's geothermal, um, in order to satisfy your building needs. When you do all of that, then you, you actually have the math and you actually have the components to determine, are you getting to net zero? And what are your costs? Because at that point, once you've made those kind of uh, decisions, you can then do a, a cost benefit analysis and understand uh, uh, what the real costs are to go to net zero. And, um, and that is a process that we would manage. You're gonna do it very openly, transparently um, in committee meetings, and we're gonna document it. And, um, and it's gonna be choice points for the community and the committee to uh, decide upon which direction you wanna go. Are there any questions? Yes, um, I have the next one. So this is a two-part question. What techniques or activities have you used to engage the broader community? And what strategies have you used to help communities reach final approval? And in, in your description, can you use specific examples of challenges, successes, or failures? Yes, so um, just some examples of techniques and uh, activities we've done on other projects that we're very familiar with. Obviously, um, uh, we're, we're going to make sure that we would do this same, same process with you on your project is um, developing a website, which we already know that there is um, some information on the town website regarding the project as well as the SBC. Uh, but it's something that we would want to develop with you. Uh, that would be a, a spot for us to manage all the information about the project as far as um, the process, the team, and, and what's, um, how to get the community involved. And so you can see we developed here already a website uh, for the project that would provide a landing spot for anyone that is doing a search about the Fort River Elementary School and what that means as far as involvement with uh, the MSBA, with the team, and, and really who we are. So we, we, did, we did our due diligence to create a website for you so that you could see how easy it was for us and how we have a great understanding of this process and, and how it's our job to manage and, and provide that type of forum for you uh, for the project. And so I know that whenever I'm looking up any information about a project or something, that I wanna make sure that I can find something right away. And so this would be something that would easily be able to uh, find and search for any community member, or uh, we could broadcast it out to the greater community so that way they can find out anything that they would want to know about the project and we would regularly update that for you. And that includes um, you know, community meetings, community forums, how to get in contact with us, my phones, really all the important information that anyone would be looking for uh, when looking up a, a website. And I also want to point out that we do have capabilities on the website to provide it as bilingual in different languages as well. So I think that that's important for anyone when they are looking up uh, information about a project, uh, so everyone's needs. Another technique or activity we use is community forums. So I can't stress enough, community involvement from day one is so important on any school project. And so those forums and those meetings are a way for us to engage them and to ultimately hear from them as far as how uh, they feel and how their input is important for the project. 
And an engaged and informed community is a huge asset to any project. So ultimately, we wanna make sure that we're continuing those community meetings and forums from the very beginning of the project to ensure that they're being involved in the process and that we're hearing from them on a regular basis. Another technique uh, would be informational flyers. We understand that there are all different um, to inform different members from the communities, but there also might be some members that don't have access to internet or don't have a computer. And uh, they might be different age groups that regularly relies on a flyer or some type of informational packet or anything that we can provide to the community that gives them the information about up upcoming dates or milestones or upcoming meetings. And we think it's important that we're reaching uh, the entire community and all different aspects with these different kind of techniques and activities to make sure that they're engaged throughout the process. Uh, the second part of your question talks about the strategies uh, we've used to help communities reach final approval. And so I've done a lot of research as far as what you've done as a community and as a group and as a district to engage the community. And so we know that uh, you did have an unsuccessful vote at one point. And so ultimately, I think that you've done an outstanding job by having uh, direct you know, communication, um, listening sessions. You've shared with the local newspaper. You had your district website. You have weekly newsletters. You do online surveys. And so you've done a fantastic job of already outreaching and doing what you can to engage the community. And so what we'll wanna make sure that we do is to continue that and to ensure that we're continuously surveying also the community, because that's really important to understand where people stand on the project. Does it mean having one school? Does it mean combining the two schools? And so we just wanna to continue to understand the majority and what that means to ensure the direction of the project and to ensure that we have a successful vote on this project as well. And I think probably the most important part of that communication with the community and surveying is to uh, describe the MSBA process. We understand that you have already shared through the feasibility study, the SOI kind of forum and what that means, but uh, we wanna educate what it means to partner with the MSBA, the benefits of working with the MSBA, and what are the risks of not passing the vote again, which leads to continued maintenance, escalation, because if something doesn't pass, you're gonna have construction costs and escalation continuously over any time, then ultimately potential loss of MSBA reimbursement and support. So all of those things, are so important in engaging the community, but involving them and them understanding the MSBA process, I cannot stress enough, is so important to ensure that we have a successful vote for this project. Uh, the second part of your uh, next question was, describe challenges, successes, or failures with specific examples. So I'm proud to say, we're proud to say that Dorn Whittier has successfully passed the vote on every single project we've ever done the first time. And so a challenge that we worked on, uh, we worked on a technical high school in Canton, Mass. That was a nine sending town district, city and town district. And so we knew it was gonna be very hard the very first time to get every single city and town on board for the very first vote. And so what we did was from the very beginning, like I just said about all the community involvement, websites, forums, et cetera, we also met with FinComs and managers and administrators. We talked about you know, what, their, um, what their taxpayers were gonna be paying, what their percentage was as part of the project, what their long-term debt exclusions might be, et cetera. And so we went over all that information as transparent as possible with them from the very beginning to ensure that we got a successful vote. So it was very challenging, but in the end, we were successful to ensure that uh, we passed the vote for the first time for all nine communities. And then a success that I'd like to share is that, as Chip had mentioned, we were working on a elementary school project in Manchester, and it's a two town sending uh, district school. So the two towns had originally submitted two SOIs in the beginning, and the Manchester school was chosen based off of the need for the project. 
And so we worked really closely with both towns uh, from the very beginning, knowing that one town was going to have to not only vote and approve for it, but pay for this brand new school and another town to support their district when they still have another school in town that they're gonna eventually um, work towards getting into the MSBA pipeline. And so with all of our success on the other projects that I've spoken about, we were successful to get both towns to approve the project the first time and ultimately build a brand new school in just one of those towns. And so that was really hard, but also a huge success for um, our, our team and for the process based off of uh, the communication and the transparency from the very beginning. Does anyone have any questions? I think we're gonna keep moving with, the, with our question. Okay. Yeah. So I get question number four. Have you or your firm ever been terminated from a project or had one end without proceeding? If yes, discuss any lessons or insights gained from this experience. Okay, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll talk about this one. So we have never been terminated from a project. So that ends that discussion. There's no termination in our history. As a Dorn Whittier manage, Management Partners had a project in Spencer East Brookfield that did not proceed into design development. Um, it didn't even get into a, a position where they could vote or the MSBA could approve the schematic design. Very odd situation where the senior administrator um, had mishandled financial accounts in, in the, um, this particular case, the school committee realized that there was over $2 million of overspending and, uh, and, and he was then terminated. At that point, the school district was in very, very challenging financial uh, straits and uh, put all projects um, basically everything on hold that they absolutely didn't have to have. Also really lost a lot of community support for the school committee. It was a uh, two district. And so there was an awful lot of repair that had to um, go on because of this uh, financial incident. So um, that's why it didn't proceed. And again, it didn't fail a vote, but it, it didn't even make it to the vote because the uh, school committee put it on halt. Um, what was the lesson learned? Um, I guess you could say, make sure you have good financial accounting um, and, and oversight. But I, I think that aside from that, I, I think transparency, really having uh, good um, documentation, having ease to the information is really important. As, as Mike said, you know, in, in our case, we have a, uh, um, a project budget management system that's online that you can look at at any point in time and it's 100% transparent. It goes all the way back to um, every invoice. And so there, there's nothing left to be sort of murky or cloudy. It is crystal clear. And in um, the discussion, like Rachel was saying, the, the documentation that we maintain from committee meetings or community meetings, um, really having all of that and supported, as Christina said, on a website where it's really easy to get to and transparent, builds trust. And, um, and I think that you, you earn trust and you earn support. You, you don't just ask for it, you earn it. And so we go through the process of making sure we do that. And that would probably be the lesson learned from, from that Spencer East Brookfield experience. Do you have any questions beyond that that I can answer? Oh, thank um, you. Um, I'm the next question. Um, and okay. you somewhat been talking about this all the way through, but how do you describe your team's style in managing a school building project? How do you view your role 
relative designers, architects, owners, and other partners. Now this is the sort of the final question here. I'm gonna let um, uh, Rachel talk to this one because her role is, and, and again, this team is, and Terry pointed it out earlier, this team's all worked together. So this is a team that's worked together, knows how one another um, acts and, um, and does the job and how to rely on them. You know, what are your expectations from your team members? And um, Rachel's in that um, communication role um, and coordination role. So that, and, and I'll, I'll finish up the end of this question. But Rachel, go ahead. All right, so um, something we always say is we manage projects as if they are our own. We are part of your team, so we want what is best for you. Our superintendent in Manchester, Essex, Pamela Bowden, said that having us as their OPM is like having an extension of their staff. We are collaborative in our process, and we do a great job keeping a large committee informed and working efficiently. Our combination of collaboration and decisive decision-making sets us apart from other project managers. So we will be the hub throughout this process. It is important for us to identify our stakeholders and get to know them. By the effective and efficient communication with each stakeholder involved, it puts us in a position for a successful vote, which leads us to our project approval. In Manchester, Essex, we had community meetings from the start and on a regular basis to include them in the project process. And like Christina said before, we want to make sure that we are getting the information out so that the community can also be heard. So, you know, that, that is, you know, our key role is, is largely in communication and making sure everything um, is being conveyed back and forth between the team members, the owner, as well as the community, as Christina has pointed out. One of the things that I think we bring to the table that I mentioned early on is that our backgrounds and mine specifically uh, from a construction standpoint and our firm's ability to work with the architect side and um, interact with them as we see items develop or teamwork um, going on. When we see that things aren't necessarily quite right or performing in, in the way that we're expecting, we know from a, a position of doing it, not managing it, but actually doing it, where we can, we can draw on that experience to say, no, you're not doing it right. Or maybe you should be doing it this way because we're looking for something in some other way. And, and the way, way we act with the team as actual partners, but we're coming from a perspective being able to do it. And I think that that gives us credibility and allows us a uh, healthier interaction with team members. After all, at the end of the day, all we're trying to do is get the best that everybody can give us. We're trying to bring the best out in every single player. And when we do that as a team, we are going to be more successful. And everybody's happier. When everybody's doing a great job, it's a happy place to be a part of it. You look forward to working with your group. And so we try to instill that mentality and that attitude of we're doing this together and, um, and we know what we're doing. So um, that's, how, that's how I think we engage with our uh, other partners on the project. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional follow-up questions? Um, I have just one, I, th I think you sort of touched on it, but have there been, in terms of teammates, have there been times where you had opposing views or conflicting beliefs on where you could go that you had to negotiate, mediate, get to yes in any way? Um, I think that that's a, a common um and when when you say teammates, I assume you're you're talking OPM contractor or architect. Or are you saying within my own team? Larger larger team, yes. The larger team. So, um, interestingly, the last job I was on, I was working with Shamit, and uh, the superintendent and I met at 
three times a week. I'd usually meet him at three o'clock in the afternoon once the site had settled down. And we would review what is coming up in the, in the next week. And initially, he was absolutely opposed to me in mind meddling with his delivery of the job. What he found was after about the first month that all I was trying to do was fill the voids where he might be not seeing something. And, and often we would have discussions where he'd say, no, I'm not doing it that way. Say, well, why wouldn't you consider doing it this way? We'd go back and forth and either he'd back down or I would back down. What was important from that exchange was that we were actually trying to build a better mousetrap, if you will. We were challenging one another in a non-confrontational way with, with both of us trying to do the best we could. And um, I've also had that kind of uh, back and forth with uh, the architect community um, where we've talked about, for example, to meet energy code or uh, improve on energy code. How do you, how do you insulate the exterior wall? And, on uh, the Mount Greylock job in, in Williamstown, the architect wanted to do a double um, exterior wall. So a, a double metal stud wall and insulate it with the vapor barrier in between the two. And that cost was over $100,000. And so we went back and forth on that as a discussion point and eventually decided that we would go with a single metal stud wall with mineral wool on clips behind the brick facade, brick and metal panel facade. Anyhow, so the exchange I think is very healthy. It's how you approach it and how you communicate with your team members, not in a critical way, but in a, in a, a constructive way. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Other questions? Great. Well, I think uh, we did it in 47 minutes by, by my counter here. <laughs> Very good. On time and on budget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Staying on schedule. I think, I'm sure Anthony would love to get a copy of, of uh, the presentation as, uh, as a PDF or something. Yeah, um, uh, you can email it to me in whatever format you have it. That'll, yeah. be, that'll be fine. Yeah, it's easy to send that over to you. Okay. Great. Well, if there's nothing further, I'm going to formally close this session and thank you again. And, uh, and uh, we will move on. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, everyone.